All right. Good morning, City Church. It's good to see everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks for tuning in online. Uh, just a couple of things. I uh, want to remind you uh, that next Sunday is Baptism Sunday. If you want to be baptized, uh, we'd love to know in advance so we can coordinate with you. But if you are here on Sunday and make that decision, that'll be fine. Uh, and then the 17th is our big Christmas uh, service. And the challenge is, who can you invite? It's going to be a blast. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be sharing the gospel. Uh, it's an easy time to invite somebody to church. Uh, I mentioned this last week, but the, the two Sundays of the year that are the easiest to invite somebody to are Easter and a Christmas service. And so if you have somebody in your life that you've been connecting with uh, and you're looking for an opportunity to invite them to church, that Sunday will be a lot of fun. Our kids are going to be ministering in some song and dance. Our band will be uh, doing some uh, Christmas worship songs. And we have several uh, exciting things happening on that day. That's December 17th. Please make plans to be here and to bring somebody. And then I'll just make a, a quick reminder that uh, we we are in 90 days of giving. If you have never given financially to the church before, the challenge is uh, to give for 90 days and as a first-time giver. And if you are a regular giver, but you've never given above and beyond, maybe consider giving uh, a special gift during this 90-day period. Uh, and I'll remind you of this, that if you're wanting to get some uh, uh, tax credit, you've got to have those gifts in by the end of this year. Uh, it does cost money to do what we do, and it is also a part of what it looks like to be a believer uh, to invest in the ministry. And so we want to make sure that you're reminded to have those opportunities. So we're in a, our second week of a series that we're calling Reclaiming Christmas. And I know that Christmas conjures all types of emotions and feelings for people. For most, it's a time of excitement, it's a time of celebration, getting to be with family, uh, getting a little time off from work. Uh, some people love to go shopping. For some, it is a, a more sensitive time. Maybe it is uh, it reminds you of loss or uh, maybe you've had an experience during the Christmas season that has kind of created a, a difficulty emotionally for you. Uh, but there's nothing that we can do to stop the, the, the celebration from happening around us. It is everywhere. It's in the stores around us. Uh, uh, every town in America has put up Christmas decorations, right? Uh, uh, if you're here in Savannah, there's um, uh, decorations up and down Broughton Street, and if you go to any of the outlying communities as well, we've got like Santa mermaids on Tybee, okay? So, I mean, there's going to be a way to convert the community to a Christmas celebration. And so my challenge to, to our church this year is instead of getting caught up like we can sometimes in all of the negatives about Christmas, what if we just ride the train, celebrate the birth of Christ, and look for every opportunity we have to share the gospel? So what I'm trying to do over the course of these uh, few weeks is to give you some ideas on how you can take the things that are happening, the festivities of Christmas, and use them to share the gospel. Last week, we talked about the tree. Today, I want to talk about the Christmas meal. Uh, how can we take that meal where we all get together and use it to share the gospel? So a few things to think about when we think about the meal. The first thing I would say is to, to remember where uh, the first meal, right? And so when we think about the first meal, we're probably cycling through in our brain right now if you've been in church for any period of time and you're thinking about, well, what, what is the first meal, right? Well, the first meal takes place in Genesis chapter three. And I'm gonna go ahead and tell you that this is evidence that not every meal ends in success, okay? You've probably shared a meal with somebody that ended up not going the way you wanted it to. That's exactly what happened in Genesis chapter three here in verse six. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. So the first meal was the meal that separated us from being able to walk with God in a physical location, right? Uh, it, it was where sin entered the picture, where the, the world broke 
because of a meal. And so I will just remind you that, that a meal is not a guarantee to be a moment of celebration and happiness. A meal can go wrong. And there are probably some things that we can do to prepare ourselves for a meal. Um, I would encourage you probably in 2023 that, 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 that Christmas meal is probably not the time to talk politics, right? Uh, that might not end well for the family meal, uh, but it is an opportunity to talk uh, about Jesus. It's also an opportunity for us to be reminded that our actions have consequences. And we live in a time where people loathe consequences. We don't want the consequences for our actions. And so what do we do? We work as a society to create opportunities for people to avoid their consequences, right? And, and so, so how does that develop around us? Well, we do wrong, right? And we should have to make right. And instead, in our societies, people do wrong and we say, well, you know, just, just let go of it and we'll forget about it. And unfortunately, without some consequence, what do those people who have done wrong tend to do? They tend to go and do wrong again and again and again. And so as we gather with friends and family, let us be reminded that there are consequences for our actions and that just because we are uh, uh, people who would call ourselves Christians, we're not exempt from the consequences of this world. Now, once we get through the fact that a meal could go wrong, we should be reminded that a meal creates an incredible opportunity. And that opportunity is one in which we can share and show the love of God. Luke chapter 14 Verse 12, he said also to the man who had invited him, when you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and be repaid. So he's giving some instruction here and he says, look, when you're gonna do the meal, it's not just about inviting the people that make you feel comfortable, right? Look, watch what he says here. He says, but when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And so Jesus says that the mill is an opportunity for you to bring people to the table who don't look like you, they don't think like you, they may not talk like you. Why is it that he would say at the feast, bring those people? Because there is legitimately, there are legitimately barriers that exist when it comes to communication, right? Uh, when it comes to culture, when it comes to even the little, little pockets of where we live, Right? There, are, there are things that we say that others hear and they, they don't understand what it is that we're saying and vice versa. But when it comes to food on a table, especially if you have somebody involved who's a good cook, right? Then it tears down the barriers, right? A good meal where you're sharing food allows people to lay down some defenses, lay down their presuppositions, and you create an opportunity now to be able to invest in other people. And here's the beautiful part of it. It's so simple that by opening up your table to some other people during a season like Christmas, you will be blessed, and, and so, so often when it comes time for prayer, right, we're thinking, God, I need to be blessed. I need your favor in my life. Lord, I need you to move in this area of my life. And Jesus says, hey, when you open up your table, when you invest in those who are not quite like you, I want to go and tell you I've taken notice and blessing is there for you. You will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. And so I think that the important thing to understand about the meal is that it creates the right environment for you to be able to fellowship and do community with people that you might typically not do. In fact, if we go to Psalm 23, in one of the more famous uh, prayers that we have, it says here in verse five, it says that you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. And so the psalmist says that when God's preparing the table for you, he's going to do it with people who are not like you. He's going to do it with people who may not like you. 
He goes on, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. This is just, again, a a very good reminder that sharing a meal with somebody who doesn't think like you, look like you, act like you, behave like you, creates an opportunity for you to have blessing in your life. And and I thought it was interesting because I was looking at this text and I was looking at the word enemy and I thought, well, I wonder how that breaks down in the Hebrew. And I thought this was interesting. It says to be narrow, to be bound. So the enemy is somebody who is bound up. They don't think like me. They can't think the way that I think, and so therefore they become an enemy. There's nothing inside of this definition that makes them a bad person. They're an enemy because they're different than me. They're an enemy because they don't think like me, talk like me. They don't have my work ethic. Now, before God, there may be some issues. There may be sin in their lives, right? But the thing here is that if I will learn to love them, and be willing to even share a meal with people like this sometimes, I, pres- I create the opportunity for myself to be blessed. And so if we leave it up to God, he's going to put people at your table that are not like you. And part of, I think, my argument would be today that what it looks like to be a follower of Christ is being okay with that. It's o- we're okay to be in relationship with people who, again, don't think like us and talk like us. It's, it's fascinating because I think that, like, my grandparents would make the argument that that was not an abnormal thing when it came to a meal like Christmas or even Thanksgiving, maybe even Easter, that you had people of differing views that would come together, and that was okay, Today, right, we have this like this whole mindset that comes from the culture lords above us on TikTok that tell us that if they don't think like you or vote like you, don't have anything to do with them, right? We got to teach them a lesson. That's not biblical. Biblically, we aren't told to go and just connect with other Christians. We're told to share a meal with those who themselves are not believers. Uh, Another thing that the meal will do is it gives us an opportunity to reflect on the sacrifice, the sacrifice that was made for our lives. And this is where uh, the Christmas meal not only becomes the opportunity to share about sacrifice, but to internally reflect on sacrifice the sacrifice. Matthew chapter 26, verse uh, 26 here says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he, uh, and after blessing it, broke and it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. When we gather for a meal, we break bread and we drink together, there's an opportunity there for us to be reminded of the new covenant. And that new covenant is that Jesus' death on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, his soon return, puts us into this new covenant in which that by declaring Jesus as Lord, right, submitting our lives to his direction, that we are saved. And that reminder, you know, right, Jesus says, do this often in remembrance of me. And, and I'm going to tell you, just going back to the, to the Genesis 3 uh, conversation on the mill, you can get this wrong. Paul has, it takes issue with the fact that people are coming together talking about doing the Lord's Supper, right? They're gonna come together, they're gonna share a meal, and instead of taking time to reflect, they're using it as an opportunity to fill their stomachs and get drunk. And Paul says, like, this is, you're completely missing the point, right? And so again, a meal can go terribly wrong, but with just a little bit of of self-control, that meal can become a beautiful opportunity for us to remember the sacrifice. Uh, when, When we gather for the meal at our home on Christmas Day, this is always a part of the conversation right? A part of the conversation is, hey, we're able to do what we do today because we are under the the new covenant, that covenant of Jesus. He has saved us. He has blessed us. We walk with favor in our lives because of who Jesus is. And so as we begin to dive into the mill, let us remember that his body was broken and his blood was poured out. 
And this is an opportunity for you then to also share this with the people at your table who themselves may not be believers. Again, the mill is a place that creates, it tears down some of those barriers, it disarms some of our feelings, and we have an opportunity to say, like, while I may not be able to make you follow Christ, right, because that's not what I'm trying to do, uh, what I'm trying to do is help you see that Jesus is king in my life, and, and hopefully that reflection will be evident in your life. Uh, and then we come to hope. And this is the one that I think is, is one of the more difficult ones for uh, a lot of people. And, and, and we get into this time of year and we begin to remember those who we've lost, who we've lost, a mom, a dad, a brother, a sister, and it creates a lot of emotions. And, and honestly, culturally, any time that we celebrate people groups, this is always a part of the conversation. When we come to Mother's Day, Father's Day, what to a younger person is just simply celebration. Uh, typically, the older s some people get, they, they bring some of those emotions to the table. And so, especially if you've lost a loved one recently, that, that first Christmas, that second Christmas, those can be difficult uh, seasons to to get through, right? Uh, Matthew chapter 26, verse 29, Jesus says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And what is he telling them, right? So after he has talked to them about the new covenant, he tells them that there is a meal to come. And when we gather and we break bread with one another and we have a drink together and we share in that time of communion, that time of celebration, it is but a glimpse of a feast that is to come. And one of the things that we did this last year because... Uh, uh, the last two years because my wife lost her sister is we took time during our Christmas meal with all the family together to just remember that this meal is incomplete. There are people who we want to be at the table that are not at the table, but we have hope because one day we will all be reunited at the table. And, and I, I think that this just weighs in on the importance of the meal, right? This, the, the Christmas meal should be something that we take pause, right, and we, that we take seriously because it, it is something that the Scripture keeps pointing back to. Or honestly, not back to, but pointing forward to, right? That in a, a day to come when Jesus has returned and reestablished his kingdom, there will be a great feast. And at that feast, all of those who have loved the Lord before us will be gathered at that table. It is a great meal to come. Look at Revelation chapter 16. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Verse seven, let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And so as we look here, we see a glimpse into the fact that he is preparing a meal in the future. And it should give us hope uh, and comfort to know that those who have gone before us will be reunited with us at that meal. And, and let me tell you, um, I think that this is a worthy conversation for families. Uh, oftentimes in our culture, we work really hard to shelter our, our children from experiencing any discomfort or any pain. We're, we're kind of instructed to do that, right? But what we find is that it's not possible, right? And for as hard as we might aim or try to, to try to keep our kids from experiencing any discomfort in life, the reality is it's going to catch up with them. And, and I'm of the, 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 the belief that 
we should learn to help our kids navigate the, the, the small discomforts that come today to prepare them for the major discomforts that will come one day, right? Uh, unless Jesus returns in my lifetime, there will come a day when my children will bury me. There will come a day when they say goodbye, Dad, right? And I want to have done the, the work to prepare them to be able to manage that grief, right? I, as a pastor, I do a lot of counseling, and I see people who, 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 who fall apart, right? They, they, they struggle with how to navigate the grief of losing somebody that they care about. And, and I don't have a magic pill that fixes that, and I'm not here to try to say, well, something was wrong in your life. But as a pastor who does counseling, I, I get that inside glimpse, and I, I, it affects the way that I parent. And so I'm like, constantly like, hey guys, like, like right now we're walking through a difficult season, right? But it won't be the most difficult thing we ever walk through, right? Now you might think to yourself, well, that's not very encouraging to them. No, but it is preparing them so that they can be encouraged when that season comes. And what I want to do is help them be encouraged and reminded that there will come a day that though they may not have me in their life or a grandparent in their life whom they love, that we will be reunited. Listen, we, we take this perspective of Christianity, right? And I've said this before, I say it all the time, and we kind of lob this like, hey, if you were to leave the place today and die in a fiery car crash, would you go to heaven or hell? And that becomes the reason why somebody gets saved, right? But the truth is, is that coming to know Jesus isn't about being saved in that moment. It's about creating a legacy that goes into eternity. And it begins right here, right now. So being a Christian is a great way to die, but it's a better way to live. And so I want to help my family, and I do this in moments like the Christmas meal. I do this with those who we invite to our home who may not have anywhere to be for Christmas. We talk about the fact that there will come a day when we're all separated for whatever reason reason, but then there will be a day, and it's part of our faith, just like we believe Jesus is returning, he's going to bring all of us back to the table, and we're going to share in a meal. And in my mind, I see that meal like the one in the movie Hook. I don't know if anybody has seen Hook, where there's no food, and Robin Williams is like, y'all are all crazy, and then all of a sudden, there's all this brilliantly colored food, and they start throwing at each other. I plan on having a food fight at the marriage supper, okay? And if you see food flying, I probably started that. Caleb will uh, vouch for it. He knows that I'll be there doing it because it's a celebration, right? We're there to have a, a, a to, to, to rejoice and to have fun. And that's the, the direction that I'm moving my family. It's the direction I wanna move the church to, right? Look, if Jesus doesn't return, I, I want us as a church body to be able to hand the keys to another generation and say, hey, we did some hard work. We've loved this community. People have gotten saved. And now you're set up to take it to the next generation. And then when we get to this giant meal, we will all celebrate together and, and look at what God has done. And so this, there is hope to be had during this season. And I just want to encourage you, if you are in, a, in, in that season right now where you're feeling that tenderness of a lost one or a difficult situation, I just want you to be encouraged that the hope is that, that we will be reunited with those that have come before us who love the Lord. And as parents, this is why it's so important for us to love our children, to show them a better way. None of this do as I say, not as I do stuff, right? That there, there's no way that that honors God in our lives. If we're hypocrites in the house, our kids won't have anything to do with Jesus. We've got to love Jesus everywhere we go because my goal is to get them to this, to this dinner table. You see, at this dinner table, we will be celebrating. And the Christmas meal is such a beautiful glimpse into what that will be, a glimpse into what is to come. And so as we're walking through the, these next few weeks, right, I want you to be looking for opportunities to share the gospel to share Jesus with the people around you. Don't be shy about it, right? But you also don't have to be overbearing. Look for opportunities. Opportunities are ways in which I can point to the tree, I can point to the mill and say, let me tell you what the scripture says. And perhaps somebody that you care about or somebody that you meet will come to know Jesus as Lord of their lives. And then you will be encouraged as well. So let's stand to our feet as we wrap up today. 
There is so much going on in the month of December. There is so much going on, so many opportunities. I know that there are work parties and family get-togethers and people have travel plans. Uh, don't, don't, don't allow all of that to distract you from the fact that Jesus is king. And Christmas is the moment where we take time to remember that he came here, God, in the flesh to walk out the life we couldn't walk out and that he is preparing a meal in which he will bring us all together. I want to pray this prayer over you. Our prayer ministry teams are on their way to respond with you in a moment. But if you would, just receive this blessing out of numbers. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for the sacrifice that was made on that cross. And we look forward to the great meal that you prepare for us in eternity where we will be reunited with those who have come before us, our family members, our friends. Lord, even those who, who, who we have had disagreements with but love you, Lord, we know that all will be reconciled at that table. And Lord, we look forward to that day. But until then, we need you in our lives. Give us opportunities to share the gospel, show up when we're in need, and we will serve you all the days of our lives. In your mighty name, amen, amen. Listen, we love you guys. Please, if you need prayer, make your way up here for prayer. We also have corporate prayer on Tuesday nights and Sundays. When you get here and you're hanging out in the lobby and the doors are closed, those first 15 to 20 minutes before service, that's because people are in here praying. You're invited to come in for prayer. And so if you see that going on, just tell the people at the doors, hey, I'm here to pray. They'll let you in. And we're praying before the service because prayer works. We love you guys. We'll see you next Sunday. Until then, go change your world.